Hello, everyone, and welcome to FAIR's free webinar. Uh, my name is Carrie Mokowski. I'm the National Programs Manager here at FAIR, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation, Exclude the Food, Not the Child. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. This presentation will indeed be recorded and posted on FAIR's website in about seven to 10 days. Um, please note that for maintaining a quality recording, all attendees will be muted throughout the webinar. However, if you are having any technical difficulties, you can use the questions and chat features in the GoToWebinar toolbar that you see on the right-hand side of your screen. The format for today's session um, is going to be a little bit different from our usual webinar format. We are going to be doing a question and answer session where we'll go through many of the frequently asked questions we receive here at FAIR um, about how food allergies can or should be managed at school. Um, every year around back to school time, we start receiving questions from parents around the country who have concerns or comments about how to navigate the school system with a food allergic child. Um, so we've compiled many of those questions and we're fortunate to have our very own Gina Klaus who are <coughs> here with us today to provide answers and insight into some of your most frequently asked questions. Um, if while you're viewing this presentation you have questions about any of the content or just in general about managing food allergies at school, um, please feel free to jot them down and then send them to education at foodallergy.org. If not myself or Gina, someone on our education team will get back to you with an answer. And then lastly, for those of you on Twitter, we encourage you to join us in conversation during the broadcast. You can follow along with our webinar live tweets at our handle at foodallergy or hashtag fairwebinar. So before we get started, I'd just like to take a moment to give a special thanks to Enjoy Life and Nice and Clean Premium Wet Wipes for supporting this webinar and our entire Back to School Safely campaign. So as I mentioned um, a minute ago, our key speaker today is Gina Klaus. Gina is the National Director of Training and Outreach for FAIR and former Program Director for a Cooperative Agreement with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She is the founder of Allergy Moms Support Community, serving thousands of families and professional members worldwide. A well-known speaker and trainer, her advice has appeared in numerous print, radio, and television features, including CNN, People Magazine, and ABC World News. She writes a regular column, The Parenting Coach, for Allergic Living Magazine, and is the author of the best-selling children's book, One of the Gang, Nurturing the Souls of Children with Food Allergies. And at this time, I'm so delighted to turn the presentation over to Gina. Thank you, my friend, Carrie. So this webinar should not be construed as professional, medical, or legal advice. Should you need that type of assistance, please seek the services of a qualified medical or legal professional. I want to start by talking uh, about schools in general and provide a little bit of background for those who may be new to this world. One of the most important things to understand is that food allergies are not only a medical issue, they're a legal issue. We could advance the slide just once there. There are two laws that we're gonna talk about, and one is the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, and the other is Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. These laws protect children with certain health issues at school and beyond. We're gonna talk about two terms today, disability and discrimination, that may surprise you a little bit in this context if you haven't heard it before, but they're important. So disability. Most of us would never look at our kids with allergies and think of them as disabled. The word disability is very charged and often has a negative connotation. But the word disability has a specific definition in this context. And this is important because when a student has a health issue that is a disability as it's defined in the ADA, he or she is entitled to certain protections and accommodations that would not otherwise be required. So disability as defined by ADA is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities. They provide a non-exhaustive list that includes things like seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, breathing, reading, concentrating, and then other things like respiratory functions, cardiovascular function, and learning. Keep in mind that learning is only one of the major life activities, and a health issue does not have to affect learning 
to be a disability, it has to affect one of those major life activities. And what well, it has to, sorry, it has to substantially limit one or more of those major life, life activities. Now, the decision to determine whether a particular condition, like food allergies, whether or not they are a disability, should be made at schools on an individual basis. And you're supposed to look at the condition when it's active. So it's not even day to day, which you could certainly argue that food allergies, because um, everything that a child or an adult with food allergies eat needs to be scrutinized, labels need to be read. So you could say that it definitely affects eating. But also, when you look at the condition when it's active, you're actually evaluating it during an allergic reaction. So does it impact uh, one of the life activities when it's active during an allergic reaction? Of course, eating's impacted, breathing's impacted. It could be cardiovascular, immune system, respiratory, et cetera. So in many cases, maybe most cases, a severe food allergy will be considered a disability. Although you'll see things, particularly like on social media, that say, well, the ADA says that food allergies are a disability. It actually doesn't. They don't have a per se list and they don't say, food allergies or a disability, although today there's lots of examples that you can find um, on the Office for Civil Rights, what we call the OCR, on their website, they oversee Section 504, and you can see where they're using more and more frequently peanut allergies, nut allergies, and other food allergies as a disability. So what we want to do is make sure that the food, al food allergic child student has safe access to school activities, that they're safe and they're included in the least restrictive environment. We'll talk a little bit more about the least restrictive environment later. So <clears throat> this is how schools and other entities avoid discriminating against students with food allergies. And discrimination is another loaded term. You may have a completely different understanding of this word, but what we're really talking about is leveling the playing field. So what is disability discrimination at school? It's when someone is denied the opportunity to participate in or have a benefit from something that in a way that's equal to what is afforded to other students. So if you had a pizza party and you had a child who was allergic to gluten or wheat and, or gluten intolerant, either one, and they couldn't have that, doesn't mean that you have to serve tacos, but you do have to provide pizza that's safe for the child with allergies to wheat or gluten or dairy or whatever the case may be. Let me give you another example of what discrimination might look like. I had a few years ago a substitute teacher call me because she was unsure about how she handled something. She, a parent brought in a couple dozen of Krispy Kreme donuts to celebrate her child's birthday. The substitute teacher was aware that there was a boy in class with a wheat allergy. She didn't know what to do. What she did do was give him a Dixie cup of water and take him out in the hall. She said it was very uncomfortable. They drank the water while the kids were in the classroom eating the donuts. When they came back in, you know, he brought it back in. I was chatting with a friend who was an attorney for the Office for Civil Rights. Again, the OCR, or Office for Civil Rights, they oversee Section 504 and Title II in schools. And this attorney said, that's really the textbook definition of discrimination. So whether you're a parent or a school administrator, when you look at activities, snacks, lunch, art class, gym, field trips. The question is not if the child can participate, it's how. What kind of aids or services or accommodations or modifications do we need so that the child can participate? We want to level the playing field for those who need it. So <clears throat> we also want to provide these accommodations in the least restrictive environment. And that means it's not okay to send the student with weed allergies out in the hall to have his own special snack or water. And it's not okay to send the student with a peanut allergy to the library while the class makes a peanut butter bird feeder. You want to be looking at how you can provide an inclusive activity. Is there a way to provide accommodations or services so that the child can be included? That's where you always want to start. One example, when my son was in first grade for the holidays, they made gingerbread houses and they used a, an icing, a frosting that contained egg white. My son, the year right before, had had a, an allergic reaction to a tiny amount, less than 1% of egg white in five tiny ha um, Halloween candies that, where the package was mislabeled. So I wasn't really looking forward to them having the whole classroom filled with this um, icing with egg white. And they suggested that my son and he could pick one friend, they could go to the cafeteria and he could make his gingerbread house there. And I didn't like that idea because he was going to miss out on all the fun of comparing and look at so-and-so's house. So what I proposed was let's all go to the cafeteria. We can create a buffer zone around my son so that kids that are using the other kind of icing 
aren't sitting directly next to him. Actually, there were parent volunteers and I was there. And all the kids went to the cafeteria. The classroom was kept cleaner and it was inclusive. So there are easy ways like that that you can look at and, and figure out how you can do things in a way where all the students are included. Um, so let's see. I think that's a good start for there. So Carrie, I don't know if you um, want to, yeah, there we go. So if you want to start with some of those questions. Awesome. Thanks, Gina. Thanks for all that great foundation. And um, yeah, like I said before, we solicited a ton of questions um, from our community, and we've got um, several of them here today. So before I jump in and, and start with the questions, I just want to remind everyone that as we go through these, you may think of additional questions that are perhaps, some of them are related to food allergies at school, but maybe they don't necessarily pertain um, to food, but they're just equally important. So please type them up in an email and send them our way at education at foodallergy.org. Also, um, as we go through the presentation, we might reference some resources, and just to let everyone know, We'll be following up this webinar with an email to all registrants and attendees with a list of great resources that we referenced today. So don't need to worry about you know taking great notes. Just enjoy, and um, we'll follow up after. So all right, let's get started. First question. Um, so this comes in, and there's always a lot about these. Gina, is there any opinion on having a 504 for allergic students versus just a healthcare plan? So as you said, we get this question a lot in various uh, ways. M my opinion isn't really what's relevant here. It's, there's still a very outdated and incorrect notion that when you have serious food allergies, there are a variety of plans that will suffice to document any accommodations, or that a 504 plan is what you use when things get adversarial. What's true is that when a, a child has a health issue that meets the criteria of a disability, as we just talked about, and the child needs something done differently. These are accommodations so that he, can, he or she can safely be included and access the school environment. Then the 504 plan is the correct reference. So health issue, which is a disability, and the child needs accommodations. That should trigger the school to evaluate the child for 504. I wouldn't say that commonly happens. It's very common for the parents to refer. But either way, that's really what's appropriate. Why? Because there are certain rights that a child and his or her parents are entitled to, such as proper procedures for the identification, evaluation, and placement of the child, and then the procedural rights that are given to the parents to protect them and their child. None of this is part of a health care plan, which is a more informal document prepared by the school nurse. A 504 plan is a written agreement developed by a team of persons who are knowledgeable about the student, the health issue, in this case would be food allergies, and the placement options. Placement options doesn't necessarily mean physical placement, it can mean other things, and that states the nature of the condition and the accommodations or services that will be provided. And ideally, the form will also say by whom. I think it's helpful if the form says, you know, parent will provide this, uh, teacher will provide that, gym teacher will carry epinephrine auto ejector and specifies who's responsible for what. What's important here is that when the child has the disability and the child needs what they call uh, educate, special education and related services. In our case, it's mostly just related services because we're not usually talking about it affecting learning. Then the child should be evaluated for a 504 plan. Um, that, uh, there are schools that still, we actually hear this pretty commonly, that will come back and say, no, you don't need a 504 plan because it doesn't impact learning. As we just said, it doesn't have to impact learning to be a disability. It can be impacting their breathing, their cardiovascular, respiratory, immune system, et cetera, et cetera. The other issue with the health care plan is that no single individual should unilaterally be preparing a school plan of accommodation. It's, that's really circumventing the whole process of identification, evaluation, and placement. You can't properly evaluate without this team and without examining the meaningful data. So there, as Carrie mentioned, we will send some additional resources, so you don't necessarily have to take notes on this, but there is some additional guidance from the Office for Civil Rights. Again, we call it OCR. You can Google FAQ OCR 504, and there's a parent-friendly Q&A on how Section 504 should be implemented in schools. And you can also read about Memphis Public Schools, because a lot of schools that think they're doing the right thing and it's fine to just handle this on a health care plan 
when something goes wrong or the parent files a complaint, if the OCR goes there and investigate, a lot of times they have to revamp all of their procedures. And Carrie and I were at NASA a few years ago, and I spoke there, and we had I was, we were talking on a similar subject, and there were a few nurses who were kind of arguing with me. They wanted to make the point that a healthcare plan would suffice, but there were a handful, I don't know, Carrie, were there six or 12, I'm not sure, but there were a handful of nurses, and we presented three times, who all knew and had been audited with the Office of Civil Rights. They had no doubt. There's a difference between the procedures and how these forms unfold, and there's definitely a difference to the Office for Civil Rights, whether, you're, whether or not you're properly evaluating your students for 504. Okay, um, next question, Carrie. Yeah, thanks, Gina. Um, okay, bake sales. This is a big one as well. Um, we had a question come in. Okay, as the mom of six children with allergies, we deal with constant bake sales. Every function now has a bake sale attached. We avoid them because we cannot trust homemade desserts from people we don't know. It's definitely the most excluded my children have felt. Sitting at bingo while everyone around you is eating a cupcake or brownie. Any advice for dealing with this? Sure. Um, yeah, bake sales and bake goods are all really challenging for those of us with food allergies, all those goodies. I remember the first time my son came with me to Panera, I was purchasing baked goods for someone else, and he just looked at everything behind the glass. And he he was allergic to milk, he's not anymore, but wheat and egg and nuts and more. And he's like, well, can I have one of those? Pointing to a brownie? No. Can I have one of those? Pointing to a cookie? No. And he just kept pointing to things. And then he finally said, I can't have anything here, can I? The answer is no, you really can't. And the same would be said at a bake sale for most kids with allergies. So a bake sale is an example of an extracurricular activity. And your children with allergies do have a right to participate in these activities. The question for you will be how. So you will be the leader in brainstorming solutions to this. I agree with you 100%. You do not want other parents baking for your child. That would be very high risk. So perhaps you want to purchase some, or have the school rather, purchase some treats from a dedicated company that would work for your child depending on his or her allergies. So maybe Enjoy Life or Sabelle's or Divi's. If some of those treats, perhaps they can purchase some of them and then your child would buy them but of course you have to keep in mind who is handling the money and how you know are they handling other things. You don't want them handling baklava and then handling your child their safe treats. So these are areas where you're going to have to brainstorm. And it may be in some cases you as a parent may decide for bake sales we're going to bring our own treat. It's not worth it. I really want to work with the school on eliminating birthday cupcakes in the classroom. You know, you may you may decide this isn't the one that you want to fight or if this is really important to your child then this may be the one where, you know what, at every bake sale, let's have a separate counter, let's have a mom or a volunteer dedicated. Maybe it's an older, you know, a student in one of the older grades who happens to have some allergies and understands. And then you want to look at other things. Is there, um, if this is a school-sponsored activity, is there a staff member there who's, who's carrying epinephrine or knows where the children's epinephrine is and who's trained to recognize and treat an allergic reaction? But in general, this is just another example of an extracurricular activity. And like athletics, students with disabilities have to have an equal opportunity for participation. Great. Thanks, Gina. And I know, you know, not necessarily with bake sales, but we get inquiries with the education team a lot. And we always really just recommend not allowing home-baked goods at school because, you know, even if the food doesn't contain an allergen on purpose, like you were just saying, home-baked goods really are at a higher risk for cross-contact. You know, if a parent is at home baking peanut butter cookies and then chocolate chip cookies, but happens to use the same spatula or mixing bowl, then both sets um, of cookies could be really dangerous for the student with a, with a peanut allergy. So, Right, um, and we know that's happened. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. All right. Safe snack box. Um, so we have a few questions on managing food allergy in the classroom in general. And the first one is on the safe snack box. Um, this question reads, my son's teacher asked me for a box with his safe substitute snacks and treats. I'd rather my son be included in whatever is being shared in the classroom. But can I trust that other parents, but can I trust other parents to make or buy things that are safe? What's the best way to handle this? 
Well, that's a very, those are a lot of bloated questions. Um, can you trust other parents to make or buy things that are safe? I would say probably not. To buy things, I mean, that's one of the situations where you want to build in a couple layers of protection. So if it, it to answer in short, if another parent is going to buy something for your child, I would have at least two other layers of protection where you're giving the name, you're giving the UPC, the teacher's checking, and you're checking. I would never just have it with just you give a list and, and once and done. It doesn't work like that. So the other thing to think about is when you're serving, when they're serving treats or snacks or having celebrations in the classroom or celebrating for birthdays, when these things are free for the other students, they should be free for your child. Also, it's part of what we call FAPE, a free and appropriate public education. So I don't think any teacher would start out thinking in terms of discriminating that they're going to ask for this box and you have to pay for snacks where other people don't have to. They're just really falling back on a more old school way of kind of managing. But when they ask for this, they're actually planning ahead to not include their child, your child in what they're going to serve. So you may want to decide to work on some safe options with the teacher or the administration so that every child can participate. I have, I've been, work, you know, I've worked on st my state guidelines, I've worked with you, Carrie, on the national guidelines, I'm working on global guidelines for school. I've been working with schools and school guidelines for a very long time. And what I've found is some things that work early on don't always work through the later years. So you want to both look at what you're dealing with today and then kind of take a little bit of the longer view as well. Some of the pros of a safe treat box is, of course, you know what you're sending. You can pack that up at the beginning of the year and replenish it as needing. Um, you may not be getting those last minute or night before phone calls because they have what they need. I'm sure there are other ones. Some of the cons are they will be serving your child's allergens likely in the classroom or foods that are or may be unsafe. You won't necessarily know how often they're eating you know, it's probably junk, junky food in class. Your child will be having a different snack, uh, so not exactly a similar way of celebrating. Once this way of dealing with treats is set up, it's harder to change. Can it change? Yes, it can, but it's a little bit diff more difficult in my experience for a parent to decide in third grade when a lot of kids really, they'll give up the safe snacks because they just want to fit in. They don't want to be different it's harder for the parent to go in and advocate and say, no, no, I want things to be safe. Um, and like I said, by second or third grade, most kids don't want to stand out, so they opt for nothing. So I've never understood how a teacher passing out 19 cupcakes and giving a different treat to the one student, to the odd man out. It, you know, if we have four popsicles at home and five kids playing, I don't give out the popsicles. I wouldn't dream of saying, here's four popsicles and you know, you get pretzels. They're little kids. My kids will fight to the death over who gets more marshmallows and their hot chocolate. So food is very symbolic. You know, we date over food. We meet for drinks or coffee. Wedding cakes and graduation cakes are the focal points at parties. And most schools won't let you give out birthday invitations to your child unless you're giving them to either the whole class or all the boys or all the girls but yet they'll let them celebrate with cookies or a cupcake when that piece of food is the celebration. And I think, it's, I think it can really be tough for young kids. Sometimes we hear from teachers, you know, well, they'll have to get used to it. And that's really, you know, they have to get used to crossing the street by themselves too, but not necessarily when they're little kids. And um, they do get used to it because for every birthday party and every celebration and every trip to the grocery store and other times when food is given out, kids with allergies have to handle things a little differently. So they definitely get used to it. But in school, there's a different standard. And to the extent possible, it's great when they can be included. We'll go to the next question. Yeah, great. Thank you. And, and I completely agree. I mean, food is so symbolic and it really is ingrained so much in our social culture. but. You know, the question comes in, you know, should it be treated differently at school with these students? So we have um, a couple other questions that are actually related, so bear with me. I'll read them at the same time. Um, how do you deal with snacks in the classroom, especially for allergens other than peanut and nuts? And then also, do you recommend allergen-free classrooms for allergic elementary students? There are no restrictions on snacks eaten in class, and one parent wrote that she shudders to the thought of contact reactions. 
Okay, I'll take the second one first. So as you know, Carrie, we work together on the national guidelines for managing food allergies in school published by the CDC. And these guidelines actually recommend restricting identified allergens in the classroom. So they're actually recommending that. Um, when there's a separate cafeteria, this is absolutely the easiest and the cleanest. It keeps the learning environment clean and free of allergen residue, and the classroom is for learning, the cafeteria is for eating. It's a little bit easier. As far as snacks goes, I have seen this managed a lot of different ways. Um, some teachers, you may have some luck, you can always try eliminating snacks altogether. There's not, in most situations, there's not necessarily any requirement to have snacks there's usually reluctance to eliminate snacks, but sometimes, especially for like a two and a half hour kindergarten, that may be an option. I've seen schools implement fruits and vegetables, uh, although with allergies, there's still an issue with cross contact, but sometimes it may be uh, whole apples or bananas or oranges, or they may do the little orange fruit cups or the packets of grapes or apples, things like that. That's something that's worked for some families. I've seen schools do juice only, especially in a few cases where there were a lot of kids with allergies. They decided they still wanted to have the socialization of eating or drinking in this case, so they had juice. I've seen where they have the parents pitch in X number of dollars a month, and then the teacher or nurse or a parent goes to Costco or wherever and will buy cases of safe pretzels or safe granola or whatever the case may be. That, that's another option. And then there's the safe snack list where there may be a list of 10 or 15 items that is updated by the parents of children with allergies. Again, this is one where if you have this, you have to have a couple other layers built in. So you can have a safe snack list, but if regular Oreos are on the list and another mom goes to Kroger and buys Kroger brand, I'm making this up because I don't even buy Oreos, but you know, the Kroger brand happens to have milk. So you, there has to be you have the list, you have the UPC, you have the name, there has to be a check by the teacher and preferably the parent as well. Um, then there should be, what's ideal is you have, oh, and then individual snacks, of course you can always do that. And then um, you can have your rules, you know, no egg or no milk or no peanut, or, but um, there is a chance that something will come in either individually or as the group snack. And so there should be a rule, or I recommend that there's a rule where if we have a no milk classroom and you send in, you know, yogurt, then the teacher is going to send that home with you and we're going to have orange cups or we're going to have Lay's potato chips or whatever the fallback safe snacks may be. Great. Thanks, Gina. Um, so now we're going to jump from elementary school students to college students. Um, this next question is about accommodations in college classrooms. Um, a parent wrote in that her daughter has had nut-free classrooms all throughout elementary, middle school, and high school, and that the university where she's applied is quite reluctant to talk with her about accommodations. Do you know if they will talk to her if indeed her daughter is accepted, and will they also infer enforce her 504 plan there? Most colleges are going to be reluctant to talk with the parent alone. Your best case is probably going to be to arrange calls or meetings with your adult child, and you'll notice some will be reluctant even to include you in those discussions, even though you're paying, so I get it, but legally, you know, an 18-year-old is an adult. So you really want to encourage your adult child to take the lead at college, and even if you're providing, like, the scaffolding behind the scenes and the support and the options, it's really great if your student can take the lead, at least is what, what's presented. Colleges, they don't need to provide you with any of the accommodations you had in high school, whether it's a 504 or an IEP. They can review that as a starting point. But the standard in college is different than it is in K through 12 public school. It's, in college, it's reasonable and reasonable accommodations that, accommodations that don't fundamentally alter the nature of programs, so it's a little bit different and a little bit lesser. Um, you can ask for, you're not going to have an actual what is called a 504 plan, but you'll have some, you can have something that's similar. They call them accommodation letters. So the, we recommend you start with disability services, and you can talk about the accommodations that you may need, keeping in mind that the standard is a little bit different. And then you can ask them, disability services, to doc them, document them for two reasons. One, so that you're really clear on exactly what the two of you have agreed upon. And second, so that you can share that with your professors. 
You can try to have an informal agreement with professors, and I know a lot of students do this, but if you, let's say you've asked for no food in the classroom, a professor has informally agreed with that, then it comes to test day, and th there's a proctor there, and your professor's not there. So it's much better to have that letter with you and make sure that everybody's on the same page. I think, right. one more last thing. I just want to, okay, I just want to quick thing, and that is that, I believe we are, with colleges, where we were with K through 12 schools like 10 or 15 years ago. So they're, they're definitely getting a lot of students with food allergies at this point, and all of the rough spots have not been ironed out. So if you can always err on the side of being a little bit more formal and making sure that things are written and documented, I think it's going to help you in the years, to, in, the years in the future. Thanks, Gina, and I, I agree, and I'm going to take this moment to just give a, a quick shout out to all of the resources that FAIR has on colleges and the accommodations they offer, because you're right, a lot of these parents with elementary or high school students are now, you know, having students that are getting ready to go off to college, and we have a lot of resources on the FAIR website for both parents and teens who will be future college students. Um, we actually have a really awesome college search tool on our website where teens and parents can search to find information about um, allergy accommodations on campuses across the United States actually, you know, from different dining service accommodations like does the school have allergy friendly station or can you pre-order meals um, or do they have cross contact procedures in place. Um, to other accommodations like are the RAs on the campus trained, um, is there a disability service that's easy to access, um, are there roommate accommodations or is there undesignated stock epinephrine, um, all of these accommodations um, you know, that perhaps are not applicable to the K-12 through arena but fall when you're thinking about sending your high school student off to college will be covered in this database. So I really encourage everyone to check it out. Again, uh, we'll be sending an email to everyone listening today with a list of these resources, um, but they can be easily found on FAIR's website. So with that little plug, we can move on to removing food residue. All right, so what is the best to clean hands and surfaces? Is there any way that you could please provide a site, I mean, please provide or cite a good medical study that advocates soap and water or soap-based wipes versus hand sanitizer, Gina? Yes, so we can send out a link to a study that's actually free online and you can read it. It's called uh, Distribution of Peanut Allergen in the Environment, and there are a few similar studies like that. You can always go to Google Scholar and read if you're a nerd like me and you enjoy that kind of thing. But in this particular study, what worked on hands, on hands was liquid soap, bar soap, or commercial wipes. What did not work on hands was plain water and antibacterial hand sanitizer did not work. Um, plain water and hand sanitizer left detectable peanut protein on some of the hands. Now on surfaces, uh, common household cleaners, cleaning agents, remove peanut protein from the tabletops except for dishwashing liquid. Dishwashing liquid left measurable peanut protein on about a third of the tables that they tested. Uh, I don't know if it's because they put that softener in there, but in any case it didn't work as well as regular household cleaners. So again, the study is called Distribution of Peanut Allergen in the Environment from the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. So you can, we'll send a link to that as well. Oh, one more thing I did want to say too, a note about antibacterial agents like triclosan. They are associated in, with increased food allergies and other allergies, so I avoid them. You can again go to Google Scholar and read about that, antibacterial agents like triclosan, um, assist the association with increased food allergies, and you can read about some of the studies. There's a number of studies from reputable medical journals on this if you'd like to learn more. Wonderful. Thanks, Gina. Um, okay, moving along. We have a few questions about managing food allergies at lunch. I mean, I know you, you can attest to this. We get a lot of questions each year during back to school time about this. So um, here's the first question. 
This is from a parent who says that his school district refuses to exclude the food and instead has excluded my child by sending him to the office to eat and he is only in kindergarten. Do you know what are other school districts doing to keep kids with food allergies safe? Well, not usually that, although strangely I actually talked with a parent within the last few weeks who had something similar happen and it may be what's happened here. It, my first guess is that there may be some fear on the part of the administrators. You know, when we present information to schools, we don't know how those on the other side of the table are going to receive it. Sometimes you look around the table and some people will be leaning forward, all eyes on you. Some are leaning back, they're disengaged. Some act like they couldn't care less, they're texting or they're preoccupied. Or you may see people with their arms crossed like they don't believe you. We just don't know. But sometimes we can scare folks with the truth. And the truth of food allergies can be frightening. So there is some, also some research that shows that a parent's quality of life actually goes down as he or she becomes more educated about food allergies. So you don't actually feel better the more you know. You feel worse. So in regards to your school, I can't speculate about why they're doing that. But there's a reason why they've chosen to implement this. Most districts do not want to have to have a separate location like that for children. So I would write and call the school principal today and request a meeting and get the facts and find out how and why they came up with this and explore some options for accommodating your child in a more inclusive way. You can also go to foodallergy.org forward slash CDC and look at some of the recommendations from the national guidelines for managing food allergies at school. Thanks, Gina. And I'll just shout out to the CDC guidelines again, like you just mentioned. You know, there are several recommended practices in there, particularly about um, managing food allergies in the cafeteria. They actually also have a section in there just for school food service managers and staff. So if you have some time at night, it might be a good idea to do a little reading and you can kind of look over some of the recommendations and best practices just to get an idea of what the CDC recommends and encourages that schools do um, and that the staff really do who are in charge of managing lunch throughout the day. So just put that out there. Um, the next question in this category is, my daughter's district is making her eat at a peanut free table. She is allergic to egg, milk, peanut, and sesame. She came home and cried because she ended up sitting alone. Her teacher says they cannot force other students to sit with her. What should I do? Mm, okay, that's really sad and it really, they can make, they can absolutely make arrangements so that your daughter is not sitting alone. The school can have their allergy policy or guidelines, and they can have guidelines where they handle food allergies in a certain way, for example, an allergy table. But your daughter, as a, as a child with a disability who needs accommodations, you have a right to have an evaluation and have a team work together on suitable accommodations. And that means, and you're, and you're also in the least restrictive environment, and the key is least restrictive environment. Um, her environment is quite restrictive because she's not able to socialize like her typical peers. So if you don't have a 504, we go back to the drawing board and request one right away. And just, I would let the school know and put in writing very politely, um, concisely, but that you have concerns and let them know, you know, that your daughter's coming home in distress over this lunch arrangement and then talk to them and also as much as possible find out what you can about the lunch seating situation and consider option A, B, and C, like what would work for you. If you don't want her sitting at that table, could she sit at the end of the table where they've done some special cleaning? Could she sit across from her best friend? You know, how can they keep, keep her safe and keep her included? Great, thank you. And that is sad, but that's some great advice. Um, okay, last question in this category. So we, I hear this a lot actually, um, why do peanut allergies get all of the attention? You know, milk is everywhere and I'm worried about it being spilled on my son. Plus, he has multiple food allergies. Should he sit at the peanut free table or actually where should he sit? He's allergic to nuts, but he's not even allergic to peanuts. Any advice? Yeah, I, we actually, you're right, Carrie, we hear this a lot and I agree completely that 
peanut allergies often get top billing in the allergy world when there are many other potent allergens that are barely recognized sometimes. So I, I definitely feel his or her pain. And I have a child who's allergic to mustard and green beans, among other top eight. So I can relate to that. I can't answer whether it would be a good idea for your son to sit there. It depends on a lot of factors. The peanut, the quote peanut free table or nut free table has often morphed into the allergy friendly table. Keep in mind that a third of kids with food allergies have multiple food allergies. So if this is the table that is monitored more frequently, that's cleaned specially, and obviously if your son is not eating peanut, then you could look at it into him sitting there if that works for you. But what other accommodations may he need? On the other hand, if this is not the best option for him, going back to the last two questions, his individual needs should be looked at. So where and how can be he be accommodated? I don't remember you asking about or saying how old he is. You know, depending on how old he is, Again, we often have kids with allergies sitting at the end of the table. Maybe if he's younger, there needs to be a monitor, an aid. You know, there's different options or accommodations that might work for depending on the child's age and sensitivity level. Great. Thank you, Gina. So moving on from the classroom, um, we have a couple questions that I will pose to you that are about educating others. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this one. We have a question that asks, what can schools do to educate parents at the school about food allergies and the severity of some of them and the possible need to exclude certain foods? A lot of parents say they often hear the comment, but peanut butter is all my child will eat. So you want to work with the school first on what your child needs and hopefully not more, but what your child needs so that he or she can be safe and included. And then it's really the school's job to implement those accommodations. So first I'd say, you know, does your child need to be in an environment where other children cannot eat peanut butter for lunch? Or, you know, I don't know if it's in the classroom where it's safe for lunch. I have a healthy respect for all food allergies. But I think of kids with allergies on a bell curve, and even someone like my son who has a lot of allergies and had anaphylaxis, most kids with allergies, not all, but most of them can eat in the cafeteria with, some, with all or some of their allergens. Yes, they absolutely need to take precautions and may need some accommodations. You know, we're talking about quite a few of them here. But it may mean, like in my son's case, that kids can still eat their other allergens. Now, you know, we've worked with plenty of families who, for example, they may have had some reactions from cooking milk or egg. So perhaps there's accommodations in the cafeteria where the child is sitting all the way in the back of the room and that may suffice. Could a child need more than that? Absolutely. That's not for us to say. But, in, but you want to ask for what your child needs and not more. Generally, if you look at the accommodations in the CDC guidelines, in my experience, those will work for most kids with food allergies. If your child has more extreme reactions or for whatever reasons, there may be some other diagnoses, there may be a a difficult history, there may be developmental issues, whatever the case may be. If your child needs more than that, then I really recommend you get some detailed information and a recommendation from your physician and go from there and working with the school. Great, thanks Gina. One more in this category. Um, this is from a parent who asks, should I send a letter home to other parents asking them to have their child bring in a safe lunch? so that their kids can sit with my son? So again, it's school officials who, would, who control the school environment. Classroom parents, you know, they, they may influence their decisions in some way, but it's administrators who are in charge. And your child has a right to be included in all activities, including lunch, in the least restrictive environment. So other kids are relaxing and, relaxing and socializing. We want your child to find a way. We want to add whatever accommodations, aids, or services are necessary so that your child can relax and have lunch and socialize as well. And your child's inclusion at school should not be dependent on whether or not you've been able to plead your case to other parents and their kids. So in my experience, sending a letter home, particularly from another classroom parent, is not a particularly effective strategy. A lot of schools have kind of got away from that anyway. In my experience, if a letter needs to be sent home for some reason, it should be sent from the teacher or principal. Again, we want your child to have access to all school activities, including lunch, in the least restrictive environment. So work with them to try to find ways where your child is safe, but where he or she can also socialize as normally as possible at lunch. 
Great, thank you. Okay, so moving on, um, this kind of sums up a question that we receive a lot about restricting foods. Um, in school, the parent asks, should a school make a classroom and or school peanut or tree nut free? My son's school district will not make his classroom peanut or tree nut free even after I have asked multiple times in his 504 plan. All they do is post a sign stating allergy awareness classroom. What should I do? Okay. I, first, I don't even know what allergy awareness classroom is. I'd want to find out what is that, how is that implemented, what that actually means. There is a world of difference, in my view, between restricting foods, restricting identified allergens from the classroom, which is fairly common, versus restricting them from the entire school, which is not common. Restricting or banning a food or foods to protect an individual with food allergies is called an accommodation. So an accommodation for a student with food allergies who has a disability is made on an individual basis. So in public schools, the team would decide on whatever accommodations are needed, and depending on the student's age and maturity level and severity level, it may absolutely be wise and warranted and appropriate to restrict or ban a particular food from certain areas, including the classroom, including certain areas of the you know, the cafeteria, you know, and maybe other classrooms like special classrooms, etc. cetera. Um, this is, these are things that the CDC guidelines for managing food allergies at school recommend, that identified allergens be restricted from the classrooms, specials rooms, parties, et cetera. Um, if you have a 504 team, it's pretty rare that the team will decide to remove a food from the entire building. But it's not really for me to say that it, that it shouldn't happen or could never happen. There has been at least one case I know of where they restricted peanuts and nuts from the classroom. The boys still had reactions, and they did enforce a ban for the whole school where they didn't allow those foods in for at least a period of time. So, again, you need to look at the individual needs of the student, and um, the team should make those decisions. Great. Thank you. And just to kind of piggyback or reiterate what you were saying about the guidelines. I know in there um, they do say the CDC recommends that, you know, instead of banning, a lot of schools choose alternatives um, by designating allergen safe zones, such as like individual classrooms, um, or then also designating food-free zones, like in the library, on the buses, or again in individual classrooms. So um, we know that it's an individual choice for the school and that there are, are alternatives out there um, to banning. So thanks, Gina. Mm -hmm. um, let's move on um, to teaching with food, another hot topic. Um, this parent writes, can cross-contamination specific to food during lessons be addressed? And also, what are the safest types of food rewards? Wow. So, I mean, I wouldn't. You, you, could you teach cross-contamination? Yes, but you surely need to be teaching about labels as well. And for me, I want to focus on what a teacher or caregiver truly needs to know. Don't feed my son anything unless I've approved it and know how to recognize and treat an allergic reaction. In my experience, when teachers and administrators and even other classroom parents really understand and have a healthy respect for food allergies, it becomes clear to them that any time you're introducing food into the school environment, there's risk. And reactions can vary. My son, when he was little, he, he's still allergic to wheat, but when he was little, he played with Play-Doh all of the time. I took him to preschool, and they asked me if he could, they could use wheat flour at a table they were going to play. And I said yes, because he used to play with Play-Doh, which contains wheat for hours. Never a hive, nothing. He was fine to play with it. And they called me, they had given him Benadryl, they said his eyes were red, I went to pick him up. And the, you could see the flower was a little bit aerosolized, his eyes were completely red. I don't know, did he breathe it in? Did, it get it, did he rub his eyes? Anyway, I got him home and took his shirt off, he was covered with hives. So even though I had never considered him contact allergic to wheat, and even though he didn't eat the wheat, he had a pretty significant reaction. Why chance it? You don't need to teach with food. You know, use buttons, use bottle caps, balls. Keys, poker chips, cardboard tubes cut up, dice, stones, seashells, and you ask parents for donations. You can find other things. There's so many other non-food man manipulatives that I just do not think it's worth the risk. Great. Thank you, Gina. Um, and again, the CDC really does 
you know, recommend avoiding the use of any identified allergens in all class projects, you know, arts, crafts, science experiments. Um, you know, some schools we hear from parents who are making bird feeders, but a lot of the bird seed products contain unsafe seeds and peanuts or using empty egg and milk cartons. So indeed, there are several different alternatives that schools and teachers um, can look into. Okay, moving on to empathy. Um, a great topic. Um, one parent asks, how does food allergy awareness through book reading and food allergy awareness lessons build tolerance, acceptance, and empathy between students and teachers alike within the entire um, school community? Okay, first I have to just say that's my son Daniel when he was little. So just so you can see how cute he was. Um, I am I really want everyone to be empathetic. That's what my children's book was about. It's hard for me to understand how people can't see some of the toll that food allergies take on our kids. And I'm all for education. I just hope that parents don't use this as the foundation for safety because there are issues with that approach. I'll give you a quick example. When my son was in kindergarten, he ate some candy, a tiny packet of candy that ended up containing less than 1% of egg, and he had full-blown anaphylaxis. I had to give him the EpiPen, and we rode in an ambulance. During that same school year, there were a group of moms who were very resentful of the restricted list of foods that we could have for parties. There were four kids with allergies, and my son had the most, and there were only certain things that they could send in, and it, they were very mad about it. They used to call and leave nasty messages on my telephone home machine. After my son had this reaction, I thought, oh, this is good in a way because I can tell them and then they'll understand that I'm not trying to control the school environment. I'm trying to protect my son. So even though I was a little scared of them, we, I went in for, to volunteer for centers one day and there were like four or five of them sitting at the table. And I just got up my nerve and I went over to them and I said, listen, I know you guys are mad about some of the restrictions. I just want to tell you what happened to my son. And I told them about riding in the back of, back of the ambulance with my son and his reaction and how he asked me if I thought he was going to die. And they just stared at me and they said nothing. And I walked away thinking, okay, maybe they're in shock, maybe they, but nothing changed. They continued to complain, their behavior escalated. They ended up going to the school board complaining about things in the classroom. And so my point in saying this is that sometimes even with education, it's just not going to be enough. And for children, it's a similar thing. Um, I'd like to believe that all children are good, and I think that most are, but there are kids who are bullies. And, you know, let's hope that if we teach them, and I think we should, that when they understand the dangers, they can make some better choices. For example, you may have heard recently that there was a settlement this month. A Michigan college student smeared peanut butter on another unconscious student, and he had a severe reaction, and they settled up. Of course, he survived, but... Um, perhaps if he had known how dangerous this might be, maybe this wouldn't have happened. We don't know. But we do know that for kids, you know, we hope that educating them gives them em empathy and some education. And I think it does. We just can't depend on that for everything. Amari Johnson was a sweet little seven-year-old who died from her peanut allergy and her mother and grandparents said, you know, they swore she'd never eat anything unless she knew it was safe and yet she ate an actual peanut in the playground because she was an innocent child. She just, you know, they're kids. I know my own son at a holiday party once when he was, I think he was like five, and he asked, he wanted to eat these potato chips, and he knew he wasn't supposed to eat anything unless he knew what it was in it, and he asked his two-year-old cousin, did these have peanuts in them? And she said no. He just had no clue. She was two years old, right? So, but this is what kids do. So, if you want to educate classroom parents or kids about empathy, I think that's great. Just make sure that you're not using this as a substitute for working with the school administrators on a plan of safety. Because educating others, especially children, is the icing on the cake. It can never be the main dish. Perfectly said. Thanks, Gina. And, and I agree. It, um, educating kids should definitely be in tandem you know, with working with the school. And just to let everybody know, we have a Be a Pal program at FAIR, and it does help kids, or is intended to help kids learn how to be a good friend to children with food allergies. There's posters and activity sheets and bookmarks. So it's a, it's a start to lay that foundation of empathy, which can be built both inside and outside of the home. Um, all right, last topic we're going to talk about, a huge one, safe celebrations. 
Um, so this actually is from a teacher. Um, and she writes, as a teacher at a school with a lot of parental participation and also a history of classroom parties with food, how do you recommend I make the transition to food-free celebrations? Also, how do I successfully present this concept to parents so they will not show up with unexpected cupcakes? And then if they do, what should I do? Okay. So when you set <laughs> the boundary, yeah. um, I don't know that there's anything you can do so that they will never show up with unexpected, unexpected cupcakes. When you set a boundary, you can't control how they will, how others will act or react. All you can do is first communicate clearly. So we're all busy. That may entail repeating the message a few times. So perhaps at back to school night or you know, you explain the new policy. Perhaps you send a reminder email, especially before the holidays. Perhaps you send a flyer home with the kids so that they remember. And maybe you tell the kids as well. You you can try to anticipate how they react, which is what you've done. The question says, what should I do if they bring in the cupcakes anyway? Again, you can't really control what they do. Instead tell them what you'll do. I worked with an elementary principal once and she eliminated birthday treats in her elementary school and she told them, if you bring them to the office, we will not accept them. If you send them in with your child, we'll send them back home with them. And she did. And I think it happened a few times. And people just liked this policy and talked about it for the first year. And then they adjusted. And the other thing you can do to start the ball rolling is give them Tell them what they can do. So if you're anytime you're taking something away, often it you know provokes people because they have a sense of entitlement over what they've had. They don't like that. But tell them, you know, really make some fun options for what they can do. So in the younger grades, or even in some of the older elementary school grades, can they have pajama day? Can they have you no know, homework passes? Can they sit at the teacher's desk for the day or be the line leader? Can they have extra recess? How about mom or dad or grandma or grandpa can come up and read a story? There, you could buy and donate a game or lend them a game to play in class. For my son's favorite thing when he was little was I painted an old cardboard box like a treasure chest brown, and then we went to the dollar store and bought like little trinkets that were two for a dollar, little games and stuff, and we wrapped them. We had each kid pick a number, and then they all came up one, but we had extras in the box, and they all got to pick a treasure. And now they have even really cute treasure type chest boxes at Michael's that you can buy for a few dollars. They're really cute. So. It's, you know, expect some folks to be moderately upset over a change like that. Uh, luckily, there are some new um, USDA wellness initiatives this year that should address food served in the classroom, effective 27, 2018. So this is really a great time to implement a change like that for health and safety reasons and also for inclusion. So um, speaking of inclusion, before we wrap up, I would like, uh, Carrie would like to talk to you a little bit about our Teal Pumpkin Project. I really enjoyed answering your questions today. And take it away, Carrie. Awesome. Thanks, Gina. And thank you so much for taking the time um, and having such thoughtful answers to the many questions we have. Uh, so really quickly, in the last couple of minutes, um, as many of you know, Halloween uh, can be such a tricky time for families managing food allergies. Many of the traditional Halloween treats, treats just aren't safe for children um, with life-threatening food allergies. So here you have the Teal Pumpkin Project. It promotes safety, inclusion, and respect of individuals managing food allergies. Just a little background, it was launched as a national campaign by FAIR in 2014. Um, it encourages people to raise awareness of food allergies and promotes the inclusion of all trick-or-treaters throughout the holiday, Halloween season. Um, it's actually a worldwide movement that offers um, an alternative for kids with food allergies, as well as any other children for whom candy is not an option. Plus, it just keeps Halloween a fun, positive experience for all. And just a, a few quick steps um, to let you all know how to participate. It's really simple. You can just provide non-food treats to your trick-or-treaters. Um, you can paint a real pumpkin teal. Teal is the color of food allergy awareness. You could also purchase a teal pumpkin from a local retailer store. Um, they're all over the country being sold. And then what you can do is place the teal pumpkin in front of your home to indicate to all passerbys that you have non-food treats available. Um, if you're looking for any additional um, free signs or posters, um, you can access them you know, at the tealpumpkinproject.org or at the fair store at store.foodallergy.org. Um, I think last year almost 
18,000 households from over 50 states participated, and I can't wait to see the outcome this year as the project is expanding and growing. So please, check out our website, that's teopumpkinproject.org, and help us create a safe and happy Halloween for all the trick-or-treaters out there. All right, again, thank you so much to Gina. Um, if you've had additional questions throughout this webinar, please send them to us at education at foodallergy.org. Um, and for any additional information or resources, you can check out our website. And lastly, we'll be following up to all of you um, with an email highlighting some of the resources that we covered here today. So thank you all so much for your time and joining us, and we hope to have you on board next time. Take Thank care. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks, Tina.